Welcome to the study of God's Word recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now let's open our Bibles and study God's Word. Pastor Ed has been taking us through the book of Acts together, uh, and we're a bit beyond this right now. We've already been through Acts chapter 12, but we're going to take a little bit of a different kind of a look at this section, Acts chapter 12. Um, and, and the title of the message today, uh, and again, Pastor Ed is not here, uh, so I apologize to those of you that came uh, for him, uh, but I have the privilege of stepping in today, and I'm honored to be here. Uh, the title of the message today is Help from Heaven, God's Holy Angels. So we're going to take a little bit of a look today at angels. Um, the Bible does tell us that all around us is an unseen world. And again, we live in the natural. So that's kind of how we base our reality on the things we can touch and taste and see and smell, the five senses. That's how we live. Uh, we can't see the spiritual realm. Uh, it's invisible. And so many people think because the spiritual realm is invisible, things like angels or spiritual warfare is just fictional. And so you see a lot of artwork. When we think of angels, maybe right away the vision that comes into your head uh, is the, the, the angels that sit on these puffy clouds and they've got their harp and they just look bored out of their minds playing the harp. Um, but the Bible tells us, again, we would say, well, this is the real world, what I can see and touch and feel. The Bible would say that the spiritual world all around us, we could say, is the real, real world. Uh, that it is just as real as what you can, you can sense uh, and touch right now. And the effects of this unseen spiritual realm are seen and felt around us in our everyday living. So my hope then, as we look at Acts 12 and, and a little bit of a study on angels, is that we can pull back the curtain today on the spiritual realm uh, and, and know that no matter what it is this morning that you have brought into this place, that you would know that you are not alone, that God says he is for you, that God loves you, that God has a plan even in the midst of the difficulties of your life, and that we have this help from heaven uh, available to us. And so uh, it is true that we can cultivate, and, and I think God's going to want to do that in some of our hearts this morning, a sense of the spiritual realm that is all around us, because we see it so much in Scripture. So we're in Acts 12. Let's pray before we begin. God, we thank you so much for this morning and for what you've done in this place already and for what you're doing. Uh, and we believe, God, you've got a word for us. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, uh, that you would take your word and apply it to our hearts. Uh, church, I just want to take a moment, if you would, and just pray for those around us this morning that the Lord would open up our hearts to the word and that the Lord would open up his word to our hearts. So if you would just quietly in your heart, the person on your left, the person on your right, just pray that God would speak to them today. And if you don't mind, uh, would you pray for me? And would you pray that God would use me, that the Holy Spirit would take his word and uh, apply it as well to your heart this morning? And so, Father, we are trusting you. We're so thankful for a church that we can come to and where we can open your word. We can go line upon line, precept upon precept, verse by verse. God, you uh, are so faithful in so many ways, God, to speak to us. God, you have been nothing but good to us. There may be a lot in our lives right now that is not good, but we have a God that is always good. And so we're trusting you as our good God to speak to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 12, starting here in verse 1. About that time, Herod, the king, stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Verse 2 tells us, then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. The church at this, up to this point had been relatively successful. Things had been going great. It was exploding. People were getting saved. God was adding to the church uh, thousands upon thousands of people. It was spreading. 
But things began right around this time to get very, very difficult. As it starts here in verse 1, now about this time, it says, most scholars believe this was around 44 AD. This would have then been 11 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. So not long. Uh, Herod the king here is Agri- Agrippa the first. Uh, he's the nephew to Herod Antipas that we remember reading of towards the end of Jesus' life during his trial. Uh, he is the grandson of Herod the Great. And if that sounds familiar, Herod the Great, we read of in the Christmas story, was around at the time of Jesus' birth. And Herod Agrippa here chose to live and set up his throne not in Rome, which would be more common, or not in Caesarea. He chose to live and set up his throne in Jerusalem uh, among the Jewish people. He himself was not a Jew, uh, but he followed along many of their customs and their dietary laws And now he's hearing all the complaints from the Jews who were no fans of Christians. And he's hearing about this Nazarene sect and this man named Jesus. And so it says that what he does here in order to please the Jewish constituents that he was among, he took James, the apostle, uh, the, uh, the disciple, the one who wrote the book of James. He takes him and it says he decapitates him. Church history tells us that taking his head with a sword. And now this man that God used so greatly is just off the scene, just gone in a moment. And so Herod saw that that pleased the Jews. He was a typical politician. He saw that that was something that that made them happy. So he decides here to also take another great man, an apostle and a, a disciple, Peter, and he throws him into prison. And he intends to also put Peter to death but it was going to have to happen after the seven-day Passover feast. These were two of of the church's main leaders uh, of the early church, Peter and James, and of course there was John as well, who was another one. So in the midst of this oncoming suffering and the death of many, many Christians and persecution in the days of this early church, Peter, James, and John were still there among them. Now James is gone. And if we remember, those three, Peter, James, and John, uh, they were the ones that were there when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. The other nine weren't there. Peter, James, and John were the three that Jesus invited up to the Mount of Transfiguration, if you remember that. The other nine disciples weren't there. Peter, James, and John were there at the Garden of Gethsemane the night that Jesus was betrayed. If you remember, Jesus said, stay here and pray. And then Jesus went to pray and he comes back and they're sleeping. So he wakes them up and says, hey guys, please pray for me. He goes back, they fall asleep again. But it was those three that were there. The other nine disciples weren't there. So these three were certainly, and all the disciples were godly men, but these three were considered the inner circle of the inner circle of Jesus. They were the closest of the 12 disciples to Jesus. They were great assets to the early church, no doubt. And here in chapter 12, it seemed that Herod now has all the cards. The church was growing. The church was exploding. Uh, Jesus had said the gates of hell won't prevail against the church uh, to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And now it seems that that Herod here is able to just take one of these key men and just he off with his head. And now this man is gone. He's off the scene. It seems here that he has all the power uh, just to be able to snatch a a, a disciple. And now he takes Peter as well. And he takes Peter and throws him into prison, intending also to take Peter. So up again, until this point, the church had this great success. No doubt this this church uh, that we're going to read of, uh, we're, we're wondering what in the world's going on here. Things were going so well. Now all of a sudden, it seems that we took a sharp turn to the right And I'm sure that they asked the question that many of us would have asked, and still many of us to this day do ask in our own lives, the question, why? Why, Lord? Should we even be praying for Peter? Because we prayed for James, and look at what happened to James. James was killed. Lord, is prayer even effective? We thought it was, but apparently it seems that maybe it isn't. Lord, we sought you, and you told us that you would protect us, and yet here's James, and he's dead. So it tells us here in verse 4, when he, Herod, had arrested him, Peter, he put him in prison. It says here he delivered him to four squadrons of soldiers to keep him, notice, intending to bring him before the people after the seven-day Passover. 
Peter was therefore kept in prison, and I love this verse, but constant prayer was offered to God to him by the, or for him by the church. So this was the, the kind of the center of this whole chapter here is the church and they're praying. And because Peter was here in prison for seven days, the church is praying for day after day after day for these seven days, praying, God, would you release Peter? God, would you protect Peter? God, we don't understand what you're doing. But they continued, it says here, to pray, constant prayer. It says that Peter was placed to four squadrons or four squads of soldiers. This would be a squad is four groups of four soldiers each. So this is 16 soldiers to protect this one man, Peter. And the way that it would work is you would take the prisoner, Peter in this case, you would have one soldier chained to each wrist, one on the right, one on the left, one on each side. Outside the prison door there would be two more soldiers and they would be standing there with their swords drawn, guarding. And every three hours then, these 16 soldiers, they would change shifts. And the reason was to keep the guards from falling asleep. And so each team in a 24-hour day would serve two three-hour shifts. And Peter, by the way, is being so tightly watched and so guarded here because he and James were already in prison at one point, back in Acts chapter 5. And there it tells us that an angel appears there and tells Peter and James, uh, you, you guys are released, go back into the streets and preach the gospel again. And so they do, and the morning after, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, they show up at prison, and they're looking for Peter and James. They're not in prison. The, the soldiers are just there, unsure of what's going on. So Herod, no doubt, heard about that, and Herod said, not under my watch. That's not going to happen again. I'm going to put four squads of soldiers so that there's no way that Peter can escape this time. So he's adding this extra guard. And the church, again, meanwhile, is praying, and it says, constantly or praying without ceasing in the same way Paul would encourage us to continue to pray without ceasing. We're not going to get to the rest of the story, but we do know that the church is in a home uh, and that's where they're gathering to pray. And it tells us here in verse six, when Herod was about to bring him out that night, uh, again, this is the night before he was going to have Peter executed. Uh, the night before, Peter was there for seven days, which is just a reminder to us, the Lord often waits for the last minute in our lives too, doesn't he? Uh, sometimes we pray, we want God to move, and we want him to move now. Uh, but I will say this to you, God rarely shows up early when we pray. Sometimes he does. But I can tell you, God will never show up late. God is always right on time. It may not be your timing, but his timing is perfect. And so we see that here. Just as Herod was about ready to bring him out that night, Peter, verse 6, was sleeping. He was bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now, behold, verse 7, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in prison. It reminds me of when the angels came to the shepherds, and it says there that the glory of the Lord shone around them. I can only imagine what that must have looked like, this light piercing through this dark prison cell late at night. And it says here that this angel struck Peter on the side and raised him up. He woke him out of his sleep, saying, arise quickly. And so his chains fell off his hands. Verse 8, then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. <laughs> Just this amazing scene here. It's filled here with great detail because God wants us to see, I believe, that he is intimately involved in all of the details, not just of Peter's life here, but of your life as well. Every detail of your life. He cares about those things. So here's Peter in prison, chained to these soldiers, Peter sleeping. All the Christians now are at a house not far away praying for Peter. He's chained between these two guards who keep being changed out every three hours. And he's sleeping probably for one of two reasons. Uh, it could be that maybe the Lord revealed to him that this wasn't his time to go. We do know that Peter goes on to minister for another 30 years uh, so the church didn't know that. Peter probably didn't know how much time he had left, but perhaps that's why he was more peaceful and able to sleep. 
But more likely, it, Peter was sleeping because if you study the life of Peter, he just seems to sleep everywhere. He's one of those guys that's just always sleeping. He slept on the Mount of Transfiguration. As we mentioned, he slept in the Garden of Gethsemane. This guy just seems to fall asleep wherever he is. And here's Peter, and he is out in the middle of the night here. And so this angel of the Lord appears next to him. It says the glory of the Lord, the, this light shines in the prison. Peter just still snoring on the way, <laughs> just out. Uh, so this angel comes and strikes him on the side to raise him up, to wake him up. Now, I don't know how you guys are waking up in the morning. Um, I have a son. Uh, I've got three sons. Uh, but back in the day, one of those sons in particular was impossible to wake up. Uh, he, we would get his alarm set, and then it would be one of those alarms where it would go off, and then five minutes later, it would go even louder. And so we would hear his alarm go, and it was so annoying because he wasn't waking up. We kept hearing it. So we'd have to go down there, and we'd have to do the same thing, like wake him up physically, wake him up, and shake him up. And he'd kind of be half awake, and he'd sort of crawl out of bed. Ten minutes later, we'd be wondering where he is. He's back in bed sleeping again. Uh, he was just one of these guys. And so I think Peter, in many ways, is a lot like that as well. And the angel here says to him, arise quickly. That's not my kind of morning. Uh, I'm not the kind of guy that likes to arise quickly in the morning. I like to take my time. I want to slowly get out of bed, get my cup of coffee, open my Bible. I think I know where my son maybe got that from, right? Probably from me. Um, but, but Peter here, this is urgent, arise quickly. And then it says immediately these chains fall off of his hands. That's just incredible uh, to me. Peter here is half awake, we're going to see. The angel says to him, get dressed. <laughs> then the angel says to him, put your shoes on. Then the angel says to him, put your coat on. What's so funny to me about this is this angel's literally dressing half awake Peter in this scene right here. If you have any little kids, you know exactly what this is like, right? You're trying to get them ready for school. Make sure that you put your jacket on. It's a cold day. Make sure you got your socks on. Do you have clean underwear on? No, you can't go outside without your pants on, right? And I think this is the same picture here, this angel dressing Peter. And it says here in verse nine, so he went out and followed him, Peter following the angel here. And he didn't know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. <laughs> so here's Peter. He's just out in prison. And whatever's happening, he's like, this is a really cool dream. I like this. This is cool. Uh, and so verse 10, when they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city. I love this, which opened to them of its own accord. So here's Peter following the angel. Peter's like, this is such a cool dream. I am loving this. They get to this iron gate, and then you can just picture this gate opens, and they just walk right through the gate. And then it says they went out, and they went down one street. And I can imagine at this point, Peter's like, man, it's kind of chilly out here. Glad I got my garment on, my jacket on. And then it says immediately, the angel departed from him. Angel is gone. So verse 11, when Peter had come to himself, when Peter finally kind of woke up at this point, I don't know how long this took. Did it take him a minute? Did it take him five minutes? Did he finally wake up and look around going, where'd the angel go? Where is he? But it says, when he finally came to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people who, of course, were looking for Peter to be killed. So Peter says, this angel that showed up delivered me. Literally there in the Greek, this angel plucked me from the hand of Herod. So if we take note, James was plucked from the earth. Peter was plucked from the hand of Herod. But it was the same church that was praying for both of them. And we want to take note that this angel who summoned Peter out of prison um, was there because prayer summoned the angel to the prison. And there's a takeaway here from this chapter if you want to take notes and if you're taking notes. Prayer still summons help from heaven in our lives today. There is so much power in our prayer. We're talking about the prodigal prayer tonight. There's so much power when we pray. You see, God invites us to pray because God wants to move in our lives. And so God would say, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. God is saying there, when you come to me and when you pray, I want to move in your life, but I'm inviting you to join me and partner with me, and I'm going to move my hand in your life through your prayer. 
An old preacher once said, with much prayer is much power. With little prayer is little power. And with no prayer is no power. And so how much prayer uh, is in our lives will often be the direct result of the kind of help that we receive from the Lord. Now, God is gracious, and I'm so thankful that God does move and God, wor- God does work when I don't pray, but I can only imagine what God might do as I become more of a man of prayer, as you become more of a woman of prayer. And, and that might be in your own life, or it might be in the lives of the people that you love around you. Who knows? Some of you might be sitting here in church today because you had parents that were praying for you. Or for some of you, maybe you didn't, but you had a grandmother that's praying for you. I've been hearing so many stories of people saying, it was my grandma. She's the one that was faithfully praying for me. Uh, And here I am today because of her. So there's so much power in prayer. Prayer summons help from heaven in our lives. Here's the prayer of the church. And the prayer of the church results in this angel showing up to Peter in prison. And Peter's released on this night. So angels. I want to take just a closer look for a few minutes here on angels, who they are, what they do. Uh, If you're a note taker here, and I would encourage you to take some notes because I'm going to give you many different scriptures that you can write down for yourself and you can go back later and read them because you don't want to trust anything that I am saying. You want to go back to the word to make sure that what I'm giving you is God's word. That's what you put your faith and trust in. So I just want to give you some scriptures so that you can take note of these things. And you might be thinking, well, why are you talking about angels? That feels kind of random to me. Uh, Well, for two reasons. Uh, Number one, I had the privilege of serving uh, with Grace FM on our call-in radio show that we've got Monday through Friday here uh, uh, called Calvary Live. Uh, And it's myself, Pastor Ed, Pastor Jeff Figgs from Calvary Greeley, a number of other pastors involved in that. And we get a lot of people that call in with Bible questions and prayer requests. And oftentimes, and it seems lately, we've been getting a lot of questions on angels. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe, maybe there's a trend out there or something. But as I was praying, I just thought, man, I would, that would be really good just to be reminded of what Scripture says about these angels. But more importantly than that, um, I, I just want God to help us realize that his help from heaven isn't just like out there or up there. Somehow we pray it down. The reality is that his help is a part of our lives. And as I mentioned, there's an unseen spiritual realm that's not out or up. It is around. It's among us, the spiritual realm. And so there's many examples in the Bible of angels. Uh, I wanted to, I thought this would be a good scripture to kind of give us a behind the scenes into the spiritual realm. Um, But when we open the Bible, we discover that 34 out of the 66 books in the Bible speak about angelic beings. So that would be 17 uh, books in the Old Testament speak of angels, 17 books in the New Testament speak of angels, so much so that in the Old Testament, there's 103 references to angels. And in the New Testament, there's 165 references to angels. Uh, And and this is certainly no small subject in Scripture. If you were to read the Scripture, you would see, man, angels actually are a big deal uh, as you're reading through Genesis to Revelation. Now, an angel, uh, a definition of an angel, the Greek word, by the way, for angel is the word angelos, and and that simply just means messenger. Uh, And that's what we see so often angels are. They're messengers from God. Um, but but the, the definition of an angel would be this, a non-corporal spirit being, a non-corporal spirit being. In other words, it is a being without a corpus, without a corpse, without a body, uh, but it is a very real spirit. It's a special class of being. Uh, Just as God is a spirit, uh, these angels are also without a body, but they too are spirits. Now, a verse you can write down and perhaps read later uh, today, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. Hebrews 1, 4 through 7 tells us there that angels are called ministering spirits. And I love this. They are sent to minister to those of us in this place this morning that are born again. Those of us that have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, sons and daughters of God, angels come to minister to you. Because they don't have a body, 
They're not subject to a body like you and I would be. So there's no like teenage angels and no old man angels. They don't uh, wake up in the morning with bad backs. They don't get wrinkles. Uh, They don't decay. Uh, They don't grow old. Uh, They are invisible because they're spirit beings most of the time. But on some occasions, they are made visible. And that's to suit God's purposes. And they can assume human form. We see that in Scripture. Uh, One thing about angels that's important to note, they were all created at one point in time. It's not like they're continuing, God's continuing to create angels or that there's this angel factory where angels are getting pumped out. Uh, Nothing like that. They were all created at once. There's not mommy angels and daddy angels having baby angels. So I'm sorry to burst your bubble, all you Cupid fans, Uh, but angels were all created at one point. And angels, because of the fact that they are spirits, they are not male or female as we study them. Uh, The original language actually tells us that these angels are sexless. Again, because they don't have a body, because they're spirits. But when they do appear in scripture, we do always see them in male form. Uh, So they're always seen as as in, in that form with a male body. We know this about angels. They are great in number. When Jesus was born, it tells us there's an amazing picture that there was a heavenly host over Bethlehem that was singing praise to God because Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, came to the earth. And I can just imagine what that would be, a multitude of the angels over Bethlehem praising God. Some people ask, how many angels are there? Does the Bible even tell us how many angels there are? Well, not exactly, but a couple places give us an idea. Uh, Matthew, if you want to write this down, 2653, Jesus is there in Gethsemane. This is the night before he's betrayed. And Jesus says there, if he wanted to, and he didn't, but if he wanted to, he could have called 12 legions of angels. If Jesus wanted to, he could have snapped his finger uh, with a word of his authority. Angels could have come down from heaven to the earth. They could have wiped out everyone that was coming against Jesus, those that were coming to betray him, and they could have taken him right up into heaven in that very moment. Uh, He was aware of that. Now, I'm so thankful uh, that that didn't happen because that means that Jesus came what he uh, did, what he came to do which was to go to the cross, to face the cross. It was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross so that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, for you. Now, a legion, when he says, I could call 12 legions if I wanted to, a legion was made up of between 4,000 to 6,000 men, specifically Roman soldiers. So Jesus could have easily, if he wanted to, called 60,000 to 80,000 angels in that moment. So that gives us a little bit of an idea that there's a lot. When we get to the book of Revelation, John is there getting the revelation of Jesus. He's in the throne room. He's seeing what's taking place. And it says there, he uses this word that he saw a myriad, or actually literally myriads of angels there. A myriad can mean one of two things. It's either a reference to an innumerable amount of angels, more than the eye can see. So if you just picture a sea of countless angels, that could be myriads there. But more literally, for you math guys and girls here, a myriad is 10,000 times 10,000 plus thousands of thousands. So when a mathematician figured that out, myriads, in this case, uh, John could have potentially been seeing over 100 million angels that were recorded in that one scene alone. Incredible. So how many angels are there? I don't know. Uh, But there's a lot. That I do know. There's a lot of angels. And we do know this. There are two angels that are named for us. Uh, We know their names. Uh, Many of us have actually named some of our kids after the names of these angels. One of them is Michael. Michael is the archangel. Uh, There are not archangels, plural. There's one archangel. Uh, And the reason we know that, it is always singular in the original language and always has the definite article there, the archangel. There's only one. And as you study angels in the Bible, he is said to be the head over all of the angels. Uh, He also has specific duty, we see this in the book of Daniel, over the nation of Israel. 
And so who knows what role he might be playing right now uh, with the conflict uh, with Israel and Gaza. Uh, Who knows what role, but we do know he will be taking a a role in the end times as that is unfolding. uh, And Israel certainly a big part of that. In fact, when the church, you and I, are raptured, uh, he is involved in that ministry. It tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the Lord descends with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. So as God decides to come for his people and take us home, Michael's somehow involved in that, and his voice is somehow speaking in the midst of that. And then, of course, we see Michael again, the archangel mentioned in Jude chapter 1, verse 6. There's another angel that is named for us as well, Ed Taylor. No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) The second angel is Gabriel. Uh, You guys may know a Gabe in your life as well. This angel Gabriel is not an archangel like Michael was, uh, but he does seem to be high in angelic hierarchy, Uh, whatever that is. It's hard to be dogmatic about angelic hierarchy or demonic hierarchy. Uh, There's some indication in scripture potentially of that being a part of uh, the different classes. But we do know about Gabriel. He is a messenger. So he's one who makes announcements. We see him speaking with Daniel in the book of Daniel. Then, as mentioned, he spoke to Mary before the birth of Jesus and said that the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, Mary, and you're going to give birth to a son, and his name is going to be Jesus, uh, God with us, because he is going to save his people uh, from their sin. Amazing. So he was at least in charge of birth announcements, we see. Um, Then there are two classes of angels. Now, these angels, we kind of picture angels maybe as a big dude with two wings behind them. Uh, But these two classes, the cherubim and the seraphim, they potentially are different even than the kind of angel that Michael uh, and Gabriel would be. Uh, And so cherubim, C-H-E-R-U-B-I-M, seem to be, again, these angelic beings, but unlike the other angels. The cherubim, Scripture tells us, have four faces and four wings. We don't typically see this picture too much in in art museums of angels. Uh, It tells us the cherubim have the face of a man, the face of an ox, the face of a lion, and the face of an eagle. And and it says of these cherubim that they are found around the throne of God and they are found under the throne of God. So they have a role in protecting and guarding God's throne and God's glory and his majesty. It was a cherub that was placed in the Garden of Eden. If you remember, Adam and Eve, because of sin, they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. And it says there that there was a cherub with a flaming sword that stood there so that no one would go back into the garden to the tree of life. So that was a cherub. We see cherub on the veil of the temple as we look at that. Uh, If you remember the picture of the Ark of the Covenant with the two angels that are bowing down over the mercy seat, those were both cherub, again, uh, protecting this mercy seat. Um, Lucifer... Satan, the devil, our great enemy, he was at one point a guardian cherub. And so he is still to this day a fallen cherub. Uh, But we know he fell, scripture tells us, and he took a third of the angels with him. That's a whole nother study to look at uh, that side of things, the fallen angels. Uh, So there are cherubim, but there are also this class of angels called seraphim, S-E-R-A-P-H-I-M. And these seem to differ from the cherubim. The seraphim literally means burning ones, burning ones. And we see them uh, in Isaiah chapter 6. Many of us are familiar there with that passage where the seraphim are involved there. And so the, the cherubim, as I mentioned, are around the throne and under the throne. The seraphim are over the throne of God, and they seem to be directly involved in praise in some way. Um, a beautiful picture of them over the throne of God and somehow involved in the leading of worship or the praise of God and the glory coming from his throne. And it says of the seraphim, they have six wings. With two of their wings, they cover their face. With two of their wings, they cover their feet. And with two of their wings, it says they fly. So uh, we see examples all throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament of angels. I just want to give a couple of examples. In the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 28, Jacob is there. Jacob falls asleep and he has a dream. And in his dream, he sees a ladder. 
and the ladder is going from the earth, from heaven to the earth, and then from the earth back up to heaven. Uh, some people might say instead of a ladder, it might be a stairway. Uh, and with, again, it's top in heaven, it's bottom on earth. He sees the angels ascending and descending from heaven to earth, and then from earth back to heaven again. And as he study that picture, where the reason Jacob's having that dream is because he's learning in that scene that God was closer than he ever thought God was in his life, and that there was real access and real interaction between heaven and earth. Such a beautiful picture. I love that because it's true for us today as well. In 1 Kings 19, there's another man, Elijah. And Elijah there, God uses in some incredible ways. And in, in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, he uses him to accomplish this incredible victory there over the prophets of Baal. But then he hears that Queen Jezebel is after him and wants to kill him. So it says he runs, he flees out into the wilderness. And it says he falls underneath this juniper tree. And when he falls there, he just wants to die. Uh, his tank is on empty and he's got nothing left and he's just done. And so it says there he falls asleep uh, and then when he wakes up, there is an angel sitting next to him. How cool is that? And it says that the angel is there preparing food for him. Some people have said this is the first angel food cake that we see right there. And so he eats it and then he falls back asleep and he wakes up again, and there's the angel still preparing food and feeding him and strengthening him, and he falls back asleep. And this continues, it says, this angel strengthens him for 40 days and 40 nights. Just imagine that. And then right after Elijah, another man is on the scene, Elisha, and it says there that he is at the city Dothan, and he is sleeping. And that night, in the middle of the night, the Syrian army, their enemies, come and they surround the city of Dothan. So Elijah's servant wakes up. Uh, and, and he wakes up Eli Elisha and says, our, our enemies have surrounded us here. And so Elisha prays to God, God, would you open my servant's eyes to see what's happening in the spiritual unseen realm? And so the Lord does that. And Elisha's servant sees the angels of God, it says, and the chariots of fire around the city. And they outnumbered the Syrian city. So he got just a brief glimpse of what is happening there behind the veil in the spiritual realm. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 10, it says there he falls on his face, he's overwhelmed, and it tells us there an angel touches him and strengthens him and stands him back up on his feet again. So in the Old Testament, we see angels are ministering spirits. Then as we move into the New Testament, we watch angels in the life of Jesus they were there at the very beginning, even before Jesus was born. It says that angels spoke to Zechariah and Elizabeth, telling them about the birth of John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus. Then Joseph, Jesus' uh, earthly father, an angel spoke to him as well. Of course, the angel Gabriel came and spoke to Mary and announced uh, the birth of her son, uh, Jesus. The angels come then to the shepherds, and they say to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Then when Jesus was 30 years old, he was baptized. He heads out into the wilderness. It tells us there that he was tempted by the devil, by Satan there for 40 days. And when Satan leaves, it says the angels came and they ministered to Jesus and they fed him and they strengthened him, a little bit like Elijah there. And then we see later Jesus in Gethsemane. He's at the Mount of Olives. He is about ready to face his accusers and face the cross. And it says there that he's praying and Jesus is agonizing so much so that it says that he is sweating these great drops of blood. And as he's there, right before he was about ready to be handed over, it says an angel came to Jesus and ministered to him in that moment and strengthened him. See, even Jesus need, needed to be strengthened in that moment by an angel, by an angel. So, so much of what we see in the scripture of these angels is a beautiful picture of this ministry of heaven. Uh, when we're fatigued, when we're discouraged, uh, they, they often have a role. Now, when Jesus went to the cross, that's the one time we don't see angels involved in his life. Because when Jesus endured the cross, he had to endure it alone. There was no help from heaven there in that moment. It says even the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus 
Jesus had to endure that alone for us, for you, for me. Wonderfully, uh, the story of the resurrection three days later also gives us again a picture of angels showing back up in the scene and people are showing up at this tomb that is now empty and the angels are there and they're saying, he's not here. He's risen from the dead. And then later when Jesus ascends to heaven, he takes his disciples up to the mountain and it says that he's literally lifted up off of the ground and he goes up into the sky, into the clouds and the disciples are standing there looking and an angel appears there and says, you men of God, why are you standing around? In the same way he left, he will return. And speaking of his return, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8 tell us that when Jesus returns, he will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. I love that. Angels involved in the life of Jesus. And there's many places, of course, we just looked at Acts chapter 12 uh, and throughout the book of Acts that we see of angels as well. Uh, Acts 28, P, uh, Paul is there on the boat and the boat is in the midst of this crazy storm. It's about ready to be shipwrecked on the rocks. But it says right before that happens, an angel came to Paul and ministered to him and encouraged him for what was ahead for him. So I think about you and about me and how many times have you and I been somewhere and unknown to us, whatever angel guards us, how may, might they have strengthened us at some moment in our lives that perhaps we didn't even know? You know, when they do minister to us, they are not serving us, they're serving Jesus. Um, but Jesus then sends them to strengthen us wonderfully because Jesus loves us. I wonder how many times have the angels perhaps allowed us to go another mile when we thought we couldn't even take another step? Uh, how many times uh, did they protect us? Um, perhaps, and I hear a lot of these stories, people that have been in car accidents, and you'll hear them say, man, I should have died in that car accident. Somehow I survived. There must have been an angel watching over me. Well, that's true. How, how many times perhaps has that happened? Or near misses, right? Times there were almost accidents. Uh, how many times... Had angels strengthened you like they did Jesus or Elijah when you were weary or when you were discouraged? How many times perhaps did someone plan to do you harm? Maybe in the BC before Christ days, but it never came to fruition because angelic intervention was around you on behalf of Jesus himself. Charles Spurgeon, the great British preacher from over 100 years ago, says this of the angels. They had received commission from their Lord and our Lord to watch carefully over the interests of the faithful. These angels watch carefully over you, over our interests. Psalm 91 verse 11 says this, God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways, even at our death. Uh, David Jeremiah writes a great book on angels, and he's speaking there of the story Jesus tells in Luke chapter 16, and David Jeremiah says this, no Christian is abandoned at the moment of death. The angels are the ushers, and our passage to heaven is under their escort. Just imagine, you know, out of every person in this room, at some point, we're all going to pass from this world into eternity. So we're going to breathe our last breath. We're going to close our eyes. We're going to open our eyes in eternity. We're going to see Jesus face to face. What a day that's going to be. Uh, we're going to hear from him those words we've been longing for. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of, of your beloved. And imagine what role the angels are going to take in ushering us to that place in those days. And it's important for us to know that we don't glorify angels. We don't worship angels. There is people out there, there are people out there that do that. Uh, even in the early church, Paul had to write to the church at Colossia. He says in Colossians 2.18, some of the people there were falling into worshiping angels, but he says that ought not to be. That's not the way this goes. They are simply here to point us, they're ministering to us, pointing us back to Jesus. John, even twice in the book of Revelation, he's overwhelmed in the presence of God in heaven in front of an angel. He falls before the angel to worship him. And the angel had to say, get up, get up. Don't worship me. You worship the one that's on the 
throne. Um, and it's, it's possible, you know, there's a lot out there in YouTube and TikTok and all these places where there are books written and people talking about angels. There's all sorts of stuff, stories. People love to uh, emphasize these things. The reality is they are just ministering spirits, but we glorify the one that they are ministering to, Jesus Christ. That's where our attention and our heart and our focus is. And, and as we see, angels certainly, though, are no small subject in Scripture. Um, and this is very important because of all the stuff out there on angels and people want to say things like, when you die, you become an angel. And my guardian angel is watching over me. You know, the scripture doesn't know anything of, of that, of us becoming angels. Um, you just have to be careful not to project beyond what we're given in scripture when it comes to angels. What we have written is what we know and nothing beyond that. There's a lot of conjecture. There's a lot of thoughts. A lot of times people ask questions we just don't have answers to. Uh, we don't want to go beyond this, but what we do have, God does want us to know. God did record those things for us. The Bible even says this, you may have met an angel at one point. Maybe you didn't even know it. Hebrews says this in Hebrews 3.12. I love this. Be careful how you minister and how you show hospitality to different people um, the writer there would say, even strangers, for some have ministered to angels unaware, without even recognizing it. How beautiful that perhaps someone that you have at one point in your life run into, or maybe somebody you will run into, could in fact be an angel. Just a remarkable thought. There could be one among us even now. Uh, there could be one here this weekend. I think of this often that as the redeemed, uh, the church, the gathering, as we gather week in, week out, we are here to worship the Lord, to sit underneath the teaching of his word. We know a couple things. We know that the Lord says that when we worship, he comes and he inhabits the praises of his people, that he is here in our midst. And so if the angels of one of their role is to be around the throne of God and under the throne of God and over the throne of God and directing praise, if God is in our midst, then certainly there is an angelic uh, beings attending everywhere because that's what they do. They attend to the Lord. Uh, it also says where two or three are gathered, he is already there in our midst. So think of what it must be like in the spiritual realm as we gather to worship. I was sitting and listening to you guys just beautifully, the voices, holy, 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 singing that song of heaven. And as we look in Revelation, there's, there's places where the angels worship God. Then there's pla places where the blood-bought, redeemed worship God. And who knows that even as we're worshiping now, are they perhaps part of that behind the scenes, also lifting their hands, also glorifying God himself? Psalm 91 verse 11 says this, he gives his angels charge over us. They have that role. Uh, Psalm 34 verse 7, we read that today in our psalm reading together. It says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and this angel or the angels deliver him. Uh, I'm from Philadelphia, as I mentioned, and my pastor would tell this story of back when he had just gotten saved. It was 1979. The Jesus movement uh, was uh, happening at that time. So there were just amazing things. The Holy Spirit was being poured out. The gifts of the Spirit were, were very present. There were miracles that were happening. And he tells of uh, this prayer meeting that this group of hippies had on Sunday nights where they would get together and they would pray uh, week in, week out. And it was wonderful. And he says at one point there was this young guy that shows up um, and he was blind in one eye. He was 18 years old and he shows up and it says that one of his eyes, I think it was his left eye, would go back and forth really, really fast like this. The one eye's looking at you and one eye's doing this. And, and he was like, it was so hard to look at this and not get distracted. But here's this guy. And then he says he would come for a number of Sunday nights and continue to show up. And one Sunday as they were praying, it says that he asked for prayer for healing. And so they prayed for him. And as they were praying, uh, he recounts that his eye that was moving back and forth really fast started to slow down. And then it finally stopped. And he says, in that moment, this young 18-year-old guy received sight in that eye. And they were looking at each other like, what just happened? <laughs> like God, God is in our midst. And they continued uh, to have an extended prayer and worship time that night. Uh, and it was wonderful. And so as people left and they were closing up and locking the doors, they went outside and there was a young 20-year-old guy, another guy. 
He's sitting on a chair out in front of this building, and this guy was weeping, and he was crying, and, and they went up to him and asked him, well, what's, what's wrong? What's going on? And he says, well, I was with you tonight praying, and as you prayed for the man that was blind with the eye problem, he says, I looked up, and I saw an angel standing over top of all of you, swinging a sword back and forth. Uh, Pastor uh, Chuck Smith also says uh, that there was a time when he was teaching and a woman came to him and told him that while he was teaching, she saw for a moment an angel standing next to him with a sword drawn. Uh, Again, our church in Philly, on a number of occasions, people would come up and say uh, that they have seen angels perhaps uh, either standing next to uh, the pastor or even on top of or over the church of the building with the sword drawn. And I'm sure Pastor Ed would say, and any of the guys in the pulpit here, if you ever see something like that, just come up and let us know. That would be, I think we'd be blessed by that. Um, We're not going to think you're crazy. And even if you are crazy, tell us anyway. It's okay. We'd love to, we'd love to hear that. Uh, Just so wonderful. Uh, one, one, I think it would do our hearts good. Well, one thing uh, that happened back in 2007 uh, that I think is probably one of my angel stories personally, uh, we were on a trip to San Salvador, El Salvador, and had a great trip. There was about 20 of us. We were ministering there. Wonderful trip. God was working in great power. Uh, just one of those trips where you're like, man, God is just so good. And so at the end of this, we wanted to have a baptism for a couple of the people there. So we went to the beach. And as we walked out to the beach, it was a pretty long walk. It was a long beach, and um, there was nobody around. And as we're walking out, we're thinking, well, it must be because it's the, the sun was about ready to set the end of the day. So we get out to the beach, and we had this glorious baptism. It was just amazing. Uh, and it was one of those moments where we're worshiping, we're praising, and just the presence of the Lord was there. It was so good. And so uh, afterwards, uh, we come back onto the shore. There's a few people swimming. And, and a, after a couple minutes, we start hearing the shouting, Help! help. And we're looking around and we realized that three of our guys, and these were three guys from our team that were big dudes. These were, these were carpenters and not small guys. All three of these guys were together and they got caught in a riptide and they were pulled so far out we could barely see them. We actually had to look to see who it was. And as they recount later on, what happened is they were pulled out by this riptide and the riptide was pulling them under. And it said that it took all that they could to, to, to stay afloat, to keep their head above water, uh, that, that, that they knew it was just a matter of moments before they were going under. So much so that one of those three, three guys, his name is Ed, uh, that, that he began to ingest some of the water and inhale some of that water. Uh, and so they're there, and they're literally at the brink of drowning. Uh, then out of nowhere, we're, because we're there, and we don't know what to do at this point. No one is around. It's a long beach. It's a far way behind us to get back. It's, it's long. There's no one around. Out of nowhere, uh, we see this, this guy, uh, kind of a short guy, uh, and he's wearing something that kind of looked like a lifeguard, some kind of an outfit, something like that. And so he runs out to the water, uh, and it, it, it happened so fast, it seemed like just within a blink. He gets all three of the guys, this little guy holds onto these three big guys, pulls them back out. And it was like we blinked and they're all back now on the shore. Um, And as I remember the story going, he goes out there and he's instructing them, grab a hold of me here, grab me here. Two of the guys spoke Spanish. One of them spoke English, but they were all hearing them. The Spanish guys were hearing him speak Spanish. The English guy was hearing him speak English. And as he brings them back, one of the guys, the guy I was telling you about, his name was Ed, he was purple and blue at this point. So we lay him down on the sand and we begin to pray, of course, and, and he's beginning to cough up water, trying to catch breath. Uh, we were super concerned for him. He didn't start to get his color back for about a half hour after that, actually. Um, and so as we're praying for him, we look up to see where this guy was and he was gone, nowhere to be found. Um, within just a matter of minutes, uh, completely gone. Uh, we, we went up to the hill later on afterwards. We took this guy, Ed, we laid him down on the table there. He was beginning to get his color back and breathing. We asked the guys up there, there was a little bar that was up there. Hey, did you see what was going on? And they said, yeah, we noticed there was some kind of commotion. Uh, and we said, well, did you see another guy? Was there a lifeguard? Was there someone around? He said, they said, there was no one else down there but you guys. We were watching because we were thinking these Americans are where they're not supposed to be. We missed the signs that said, don't go in to the water because of the riptides. We're just these Americans. We don't know what we're doing. But what's amazing about that story is that all three of those guys to this day are serving Jesus Christ with their lives. Uh, And I believe, yeah, with all my heart, based on what I see in scripture, I believe that God sent an angel to stand guard over these three men 
uh, because he wasn't done with them yet. And I wish that they were here to tell that story. My wife, who was here in the first service, was part of that. Remarkable, remarkable what God does. Two books I want to recommend to you because we just scratched the surface of this. But if you're interested in this topic and want to read more, Billy Graham wrote a book, uh, and you won't forget the title of the book. It's called Angels. <laughs> so very easy to remember. He tells amazing stories in this book of, of angels stepping in with missionaries uh, and with other uh, groups of people and believers. It's just story upon story that are remarkable. He speaks of angels with swords drawn, uh, as we mentioned, throughout church history as well, those kind of appearances when God, for his purposes, allows people to see those things. Uh, As I mentioned, Dr. David Jeremiah also wrote a book called Angels, uh, and both of those books are amazing, and so they'll take you even deeper than what we've done uh, this morning. But going back here as we close to Acts chapter 12, back to our passage It was because of the prayers of the church that God sent this angel to Peter and and this angel freed Peter from this prison. So this angel goes to, uh, or God goes to the very ones that are praying and God decided to send this angel to Peter. And the rest of this chapter is the classic chapter in the New Testament of the question, as we mentioned at the beginning, that we all ask, why? 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 Maybe you're here and that's your question today. There's something in your life that has caused you to ask God why. Now notice this, the prayer of faith, as as strong as your faith might be, it doesn't mean that God will always answer the way that you want him to answer. Because notice, the church was praying, Peter was saved, but James was not saved. And it was the same church with the same faith praying for both of them. Because there are times in our lives where God God doesn't answer the way that we think he will. And so we're left going, why? God, I don't understand. This doesn't make sense to me. Now, sometimes God will graciously answer that question. But there are often times God will graciously not answer that question. Because it's for God to know the answer to the why. And I think the reason sometimes God doesn't answer that question, and if you're here and that's the question that's on your heart, it's because there are times that the next step that we're supposed to take, it's not relative to our comprehension. It's not relative to the answer to our question why, what we can see or what we can feel, but it's, it's relative to our faith, despite what we see or despite what we feel. It's not relative to the explanation that God gives us but it's relative to the fact that we trust him, that we know that despite the fact that what is in our lives is not good, that our God is still good, and we're willing to take the next step of faith without the answer. See, when the church here was walking through some of its most difficult days, persecution on the scene now, unlike ever before, James is dead, Peter is in prison, it appears very likely that he would be next on the chopping block. They didn't know the rest of chapter 12. They were just faithful to pray. They didn't know an angel was going to show up. They just continued by faith to pray. And though we may never get an answer, we may never get a because from Jesus. Why James and why not Peter? The early church here was learning a very important lesson. They were learning that the throne that mattered was not in Rome. The throne that mattered was not the throne in Jerusalem. It wasn't the throne in Herod's house. The throne that mattered was the throne that was in heaven. And heaven hears when we pray. And it's heaven's throne that's in charge. Because Herod, at the beginning, looked like he had all the cards. He took James out. But at the end of this chapter, Herod is struck down by an angel and is eaten by worms there, it tells us. Because there is another throne that is in charge. And as the worship team now comes back out, when we close in worship today, I want to encourage you with something that on your most difficult of days, that God is still 100% in charge of your life. He still has his hands on the steering wheel of your life. See, the difficulty for us with those unanswered questions is never on heaven's side. It's always on our side. And there are days when your circumstances are going to be so painful that they're not going to seem consistent with the love of God. When your life's are going to be so difficult that it's not going to be consistent with his grace. But I believe it's in those moments that God has a question as he, as he asks you to trust him 
I believe he would say, do you believe that my son's death on the cross was the greatest expression of my love for you, even greater than the answer to the question that you're looking for? I think he would ask, is the cross a greater act of love than me bringing back a loved one or than me healing a body or than me giving someone a job or bringing a spouse back that is left? Is my cross a greater expression of my love in those moments? See, we see here in Acts chapter 12, and this could be our takeaway uh, from this study today, that when it all falls through, God comes through. When it all falls through, God comes through. As we mentioned earlier, he's rarely early when he comes through, but he's certainly never late. He is always on time. And no matter what it is that you are walking through, and if it feels as if things are falling apart in your life, God will come through. Because we serve a God that is both all-powerful and is able, but we serve a God that is good and is willing because he loves you. And God will give help from heaven. And perhaps it may come from the assistance of one of these angels ministering to you. But again, the angels are only as good as the one who sends them. And it's him that loves you. And the reality is, you may not get the answer to your question, why? But one day, you're going to see Jesus face to face. After all this time of coming into worship by faith, believing in Jesus, lifting up the name of Jesus, praying, living our lives for Jesus, one day we are going to finally see him and we're going to know even as we're known. And I believe it's in that moment that all of our whys are going to turn to worship. And it's going to be in his presence that those whys, those questions, those doubts, they melt away. And we stand in the glory of Jesus himself. And he meets every one of our needs, so much so that it says in that moment, every tear will be wiped away. There'll be no more sin, no more sorrow, no more loss, no more death, no more divorce, no more cancer. And that's what we have to look forward to. So do you trust today in the midst of your whys that the cross is the greatest expression of his love for you? And if you're here and you don't know Jesus, then that's the question for you. Maybe more of a statement. The cross is the greatest expression of his love for you. Even while you're a sinner, no matter what you brought into this place, it doesn't matter. No matter how far from God you may feel this morning, no matter what kind of sin you've committed, it can all be forgiven in a moment this morning when you put your faith and your trust in Jesus, when you acknowledge, yeah, I'm a broken person. I have done a lot of things. I'm very, very good at breaking relationships, breaking people's trust. God is very good at fixing the things that we broke, starting with our broken, sin-soaked souls. And God is able to come and to forgive us in a moment. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved and you will be forgiven. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he promises you forgiveness once and for all. Your past your present, and your future. And if you're here, it's just as simple as, as that act of faith. Jesus is offering you in this moment a gift to believe on him, and all you have to do is receive it. It doesn't matter how much you attend church or how good you think you are or how bad you think you are. He loves you, and he loves every one of us in this place. So we would love to pray with you if that's you. Come up and talk to us because today is the day of salvation. You don't want to leave this place and not have a relationship with God. Uh, but you're guaranteed that if you put your faith and trust in him, you will leave him and your entire life and your eternity will be changed. And that's what every single person that knows the Lord in this room wants for you. So for the rest of us, let's stand. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.